guys, Dr. Jean here. I'm a naturopathic doctor, a natural fertility expert, and I help couples who have been struggling with infertility for over a year get to the root cause of their infertility struggles and help them conceive naturally. Today, I want to share a case study with you on unexplained infertility. This is a couple that I have been working with for about 12 months, 13 months, and we continue to work with them now to support them through pregnancy. And the reason that I want to share this case study is because I think unexplained infertility is one of the worst diagnoses that you can get. And just because the conventional system can't explain why you're not getting pregnant doesn't mean that there are no explanations. And this poor couple struggled for three years to conceive before they met me. And they were really young when they started. So they were 26 year old when they started trying. And the doctors really brushed them off because they kept telling them, oh, you're young, don't worry about it. But the fact that they couldn't get pregnant at 26, at 27, at 28 is a really big sign of an imbalance. Because I believe deep down that pregnancy is a natural process. And so if it's not happening, something is missing. And so when I present this case study to you, I'm going to share my screen. I made some notes to make sure that I don't miss anything. And I'm actually going to share you the results that these patients got, the tests that they had with their conventional doctor, and even the tests that they had with a naturopathic doctor that they saw before they came to see me, what I ran, what we found, and then the process that it took to get them to where they are today, which is she's about 14 weeks pregnant, depending on when you're watching it, she might be further along. I think it's a really inspiring story, and I think it's really important to share this. So if you've been working with a functional medical doctor or a naturopathic doctor and you feel like something is missing, I think this will help you understand a little bit more what is missing so then you can advocate for yourself and potentially get some different help. If you're working with a conventional doctor and the only thing that they're prescribing to you is medications or IVF and you really feel weird or something feels wrong going in that direction, like you still don't have enough answers. I hope this really inspires you to help you understand that there are absolutely answers as to why you haven't been able to conceive. And I'd love it if you took action sooner rather than later, because if you've been trying for three years, like that's so much pain and frustration and this emotional roller coaster and not understanding why things are not happening to you. It could be really devastating and a really traumatic experience to go through. So if I can help prevent that and make your journey as short as possible, that would make me really happy. And that's one of the reasons that I'm here. So let's dive in. Let's me, let me share my screen and present the case. I'm going to keep all the name privates. You're not going to know. I'm just going to share the details that you need to know about this case. And like I said, I made this handout because I want to make sure I don't forget anything. So no pregnancy, three years of trying. And here's another little tidbit that their doctor said, hey, you have 5% chance of conceiving naturally. There was no reason for them to say that besides the fact that they have not been able to conceive for three years. So this really pisses me off because this poor couple has been trying to figure out why they can't get pregnant. And the going to an authority that they're hoping to get help from is just shutting them down and telling them that, sorry, you only have a 5% chance of getting pregnant. It really gets to your head. And when I work with my patients, there's like the physical aspect of getting you better, but there's also the mental and emotional and working through some of the medical trauma, if you will, and reversing and learning how to believe in your system again and learning how your body works and building up that trust, that confidence in yourself. It can be really damaging to hear a statistic like that. So please, 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 if your doctor says things like that without looking at your labs, without actually spending time with you and understanding your lifestyle and who you are and what you've done, I need you to just brush off that statistic because it's not, there's no data to that. They just said it because you've been trying for three years. So like, great, it doesn't actually help you. So like I said, please don't, please don't listen to it if you can. And if you've had a statistic like this already thrown at you, don't listen to somebody who doesn't know what actually is going on for you and hasn't given the time to look into your case. So they've got an unexplained diagnosis through the conventional system. But when we sat down and we met, and let me share the labs that she ran. And so it's not a lot. There's a lot of stuff and you'll see a bunch of it is like random syphilis, HIV, varicella zoster. It's great to check those things, but they do not help us understand why you're not getting pregnant. And so the only thing that really came up for her is she would have this fluctuating prolactin. 
there would be time where her prolactin was high and then this time where prolactin was within normal range what I would consider as a natural fertility expert, it was on the upper range of normal. We want it ideally under 10. I actually have a whole podcast recorded on prolactin levels and why it's important to pay attention to those. But for her, like we met at, she was 29 years old. There was, to me, that's a sign, like what's going on? Why is that prolactin fluctuating? And there was a couple of times that it has come up high throughout the years, but there was times where it came up low. And It's not high enough for it to be a prolactinoma. If it's going to be a prolactinoma, a brain tumor that's pressing on the pituitary, it's going to be in the hundreds and the 200s. So when it's just creeping up to that, usually it's stress, it's thyroid issues, and and sometimes it's different kinds of medications. So for her, that wasn't the case. I think it was stress because she's had her thyroid tested. But this was what I would call very basic, basic lab work. This isn't lab work that I would run for somebody who has struggled to conceive for years. This is like a basic checkup that you would do on a yearly basis to see if there's anything that's wrong. And so this is what I kind of want to get you to understand, you guys, is that a lot of the times your doctor says, oh, my labs are normal. They're running like 10 markers. And 10 markers, very basic markers. So when you're struggling with issue or with a disease, it's like you need to go to a specialist that's going to help understand what's going on, like an expert in the field. So you see that, again, the total prolactin is now, it's a bit on the lower side. It's at a later date. Her liver enzymes were a bit elevated. But when I reviewed this, and this is something that her naturopath ran, and if you look at this progesterone level in the second half of the cycle, this is great, right? And so it starts to become really puzzling. Well, my progesterone is in good range. Why am I not getting pregnant? But of course, that prolactin is still staying elevated. And like I said, there's a bunch of other random things that are the same being tested over and over again. So I'll go back to the symptoms that I found. So when we sit down and I do a health assessment, and I'll kind of draw this out for you here on the side, everyone who comes to me, they want to achieve a healthy pregnancy. And they can't do that because they don't have any answers. So they can't find anything that's working. And then there's no professional support that's reliable and consistent. And so this was very true for this couple. And obviously the first thing that I do is we need to get a personalized explanation. And I say personalized because for this couple, their reason not getting pregnant is very different than it might be for you. And there's three steps that I do to help me figure that out. We do a proper health assessment and that's my initial consultation where I actually sit down and listen to all of your symptoms and understand how your digestion is working and how are you eating? How are you sleeping? What's your menstrual cycle like? We run labs, we run functional labs, and then we collect data. They had very basic labs done and we're told they can't get pregnant. Nobody asked her about her symptoms. And so here's what we found. She had a lot of digestive issues, a lot of loose stool and frequent stools, a lot of nausea. She was very anxious and high strung. She had a very stressful job. She actually had like no cervical fluid production and there was pain during sex, even around ovulation. So sex was not an enjoyable thing for her. It's like, yeah, I have low libido and it's like, You have low libido because you have no white cervical fluid production because your hormones are out of whack. And really, like I said, that lab work showed that everything was normal. Now for him, he did a sperm analysis. He, most of the guys don't get the blood work or or that kind of testing done, but he didn't have anything that was out of the ordinary, even in his sperm analysis. Sure. There could have been some improvements, but like his morphology was at 10%. His concentration was at like 150 million per mil. He had good volume, 3.5. So everything there for the most part was good. He did have some symptoms though. He had Accutane, he had severe acne and he was on Accutane for six months and his body did not do very well on Accutane. He actually had to stop it when he was young because he would get nosebleeds, that kind of stuff. He had tinnitus and then some digestive issues and also just like a high performer, high strong, like they're work hard, they're a young couple. And so we did some lab work and let me just show you what we found. And we did most of the lab work on her because she was the one who needed 
the most support. I read a bunch of stuff on her because again, you've been struggling for three years. Yes, there are symptoms, but I, at this point, I don't want to be poking in the dark. So she had a food sensitivity test done and there was like seven things that came up. Sure, she cut them out. It did very little, if anything, in terms of improvement. It's not, and she definitely didn't get pregnant. So if you're one of those people who's like, oh my God, I'll do anything to get pregnant and I'll just listen to the practitioner. I think that's really great, but we want to be mindful of understanding, making sure that we're actually listening to the right people, if you will, and that we're seeing progress with the things that we're doing. A lot of the times we'll just grasp onto straws because we're trying to do, like you want to make sure you do your best. And I love that. But sometimes we put our energy towards the wrong thing and it can really feel defeating because you're like, I did all of this effort. I cut out all of this food and nothing happened. And guess what? It's not that you did something wrong. It's that you worked on the wrong thing. And so that's why nothing happened. Maybe that would have been helpful five or six months down the road, but there were some basic foundations that was missing. And so that's why we really, really want to focus in on really good testing so we can hit the target on the nose and make sure that as soon as you start taking supplements, you notice a huge difference. So she had really low progesterone. Her cortisol was really low, but part of that is because she's metabolizing it really quickly. So whatever cortisol she is making, her body's breaking it down really fast. And that's usually a liver issue. A thyroid issue is another. And so we can already tell that there is an issue with metabolism. Her DHEA is low. We need good levels of DHEA to make the testosterone, to make the estrogen. And so, and then we could see this was done in the second half of the cycle. So whenever she did get it tested with the other naturopaths, don't get me wrong, sometimes I'll see those progesterone levels are like randomly high. And then if you test it every month, and most people won't, if you test it every month, you'll see that it's actually not as good. And that's why we want to learn how to track data in different ways. So we don't have to run blood work every month, but sometimes we need to. And yeah, that's her cur cortisol curve. Like she was just below. So even though she was really high strung, she was actually kind of in burnout phase. And the way that she was metabolizing, like her, this is supposed to be low. The arrow for some reason is not showing up on this, but essentially she was just not breaking down the excess estrogens and lots of signs of sluggish liver already showing up. Her melatonin was pretty good. And then we could see that her dopamine levels, the HVA metabolite was on the low side. The norepinephrine and epinephrine was also on the low side. And that's just a big sign of her system kind of hanging into that adrenal fatigue. So she was in fight or flight for a long time. And then her system is just starting to shut down. Now, I don't use the term adrenal fatigue a lot because I don't think your adrenals just stop working at the age of 30. I do think it's a mitochondrial dysfunction issue which I won't get down into the rabbit hole, but we're looking at the cellular level of like, why are your adrenals not doing what they're doing? The glutathione marker, that's a really important antioxidant. And this guy being low, when it's low, number one, we're looking at liver function because the liver helps, we can actually make glutathione, but we need certain precursors to make it like N-acetylcysteine is big. And N-acetylcysteine we use for liver function and detoxification. So right away, I can tell that her oxidative stress is not matching her antioxidants. So there's a lot more damage going on in her body than what is being repaired. And so her body is like, she can feel that she's in this fight or flight, but her body is actually in this fight or flight. And here's a point that I want to make. Sometimes we're like, I'm just an anxious person. I challenge you to not call yourself an anxious person and instead say, I feel anxiety. What does it feel like? Why am I feeling it? And understand that your anxiety can be physical or it could be mental and emotional. It could be because you're thinking of certain thoughts, but it could actually just be because you have low B vitamins or your liver is overworked or you're missing some antioxidants or your dopamine isn't there because your digestion isn't. So we, we have to stop identifying ourselves as a feeling and instead just recognize that I'm always feeling this way. So why am I feeling this way? What is my body trying to tell me instead of like, oh, I just have to accept this feeling. It's like, well, you got to feel it. But if you're always feeling it, that's a pattern. And we got to figure out why you're doing that. There's a lot of kind of explanation. This was just the easiest way to help you guys to be able to see all the tests. The next one is the stool analysis. This was really big eye opener. So we don't have good gut diversity, not surprised there. And then we actually detected some parasites and that's huge. So parasites are going to disrupt your digestion. 
these parasites were really depleting her system and putting an extra load on her body to have to detox. And of course, she had the digestive distress symptoms to follow it. This marker is a major inflammatory marker of the gut, and it was like five times the amount of what it should be. So we definitely need to be looking at where is this inflammation coming from? Parasites are going to be a big component. She's not producing pancreatic enzymes. So she's stressed out. She's not eating. Her appetite is low. And then when she does, she feels full often. So even when she's trying to fix her diet, like the food sensitivity example, it's just she's not, her body's not actually absorbing it. And that's why she didn't feel any different. And then we have bile acids, short chain fatty acids. Those help to replenish the mucus lining. It's really important to make sure that we have those because they're replenishing our lining. Our gut lining is not static. It's always breaking down and rebuilding. We can see that her immune system is really hyperactivated and we're not surprised she has the parasites and she feels it in her system, right? Like she feels hyper. She was really worried about getting sick all the time and catching a bug and, oh, I'm sick. And then it takes me forever to get over a cold. And it's just because her immune system is jacked up. And now when I look at it from a fertility standpoint, the nervous system needs to feel soothed and it needs to feel calm in order to get pregnant. Her body just wasn't working the way that it should. And she felt that and that was making her anxious. And though now trying to make a baby, she was just trying to do the best that she could, but she was spinning wheels because she was focusing on the wrong things. And so we want to get that immune system under control. And then there's some redundancy in terms of how this test is read. And I'm not going to go into details, but essentially we see some bugs that are really important and they're basically non-existent. And our microbiome will dictate our health. It will dictate how we're absorbing our nutrients, the inflammation level, the detoxification, the production of certain hormones and neurotransmitters. It's so important to have a healthy microbiome because it honestly reflects in our reproductive microbiome. And the reproductive microbiome is like, that's your baby room, right? That's where the baby will grow. And we often think that the uterus and the digestive tract, like they're just two separate things. They're all jammed together in here, you guys, in the abdominal cavity and your intestines are surrounding the uterus and the ovaries. And so if you have this pathogen, like a parasite, or you have even infection, like look at this bacteria overgrowth. So this is in millions and she's had multiple different types of bacteria that are really, really high in their pathogenic. Sometimes it's opportunistic if there's an opportunity to overgrow that they will. And so her system is inefficient at clearing this stuff, even though she's pooping every day, multiple times a day, they're not good, well-formed bowel movements, right? It's loose stools. She's running frequently feels like things are just running through her system. And then there's some stuff that's supposed to be there in good numbers. And it's just non-existent. And part of that is because the bad guys are overgrowing. So fixing the gut obviously is something that we did, but this isn't even the end of all the testing. She didn't have any heavy metals. So that's good. In the organic acid section, the only thing that was really kind of notable on her side, and this is, so this is now a urine analysis, helping us understand how she's breaking down amino acids, carbohydrates, oxalates, you'll see glutathione, nutritional markers. And we, I test always urine, stool, and blood because the body will show us imbalances in different areas. For some people, the blood work will look great and there's no issues, but they still have symptoms. And so we have to look deeper at other places. Blood work is not the end all be all. It's really good tool and I use it all the time, but it's not the end all and be all. There's other ways to look into it. Um, there's some neurotransmitter metabolites that were off and most of that is caused by the bacterial overgrowth in the gut. And then there's an yeast and fungal marker that was elevated. So we see that there is some poor circulation. There's some yeast and fungus that's going to be damaging to the mitochondria. A lot of brain fog can contribute to nausea, sluggish liver function. And when we tested her hormone panel on day 21, she was quite low. Under 10 is usually a sign that like you're barely ovulating if that. And the other marker that we had was in the Canadian ranges, where this is the US. So in the other marker, she was probably closer to like 15 or 20, whereas here now she's below 10. And like I said, if we tested it every month, we probably would have caught the fact that, hey, you're not ovulating. It's like there is a one off that's happening, but you're probably not ovulating. And here's where things really stood out, you guys, the environmental toxins, because we're trying to make sense of why her hormones are not 
balance, right? Everybody always, oh, it's for hormones. Let's fix the hormones. But hormones are not root cause. And without looking at the gut and fixing the gut, you can't fix the hormones. And if you're not looking at environmental toxins and looking at like the cellular level and understanding why the hormones are doing what they're doing, you're missing so much information. Like we could have just put her on Vitex. And I did it because look at how many toxins she has and how high they are. And these guys are so, so damaging. So perchlorate is like, it's found in rocket fuel, but it can be found in our soil and our water now in food packaging. So it's a very damaging toxin, if you will. And she had it. If you look at the number, like it's 20 times what she should have in the system. So her body was overloaded. The DMDTP and glyphosates, those are your herbicides, your pesticides. They're, again, really high numbers. And some of that exposure is coming through food. Some of it was coming through water for her. BPAs, those are your plastic. You're going to see those. Anything that has acetylcysteine in it tells me that it's the liver that's struggling. But of course, this is not in acetylcysteine. This is NAC still in acetyl 2 hydroxypropyl cysteine, which is like chemical and a toxin and it's 500 like a hundred times what it should be the toxic load on this poor chica is so high no wonder she's nauseous no wonder she's anxious no wonder she's constantly feeling tired and overwhelmed or her hormones are out of whack and then some of these other ones are parabens we find them in cosmetics in our right shampoos lotions potions detergents and when you see this then you're like my body is actually absorbing all this stuff and it's impacting me because all of the stuff is endocrine disruptors. So when you're treating hormones and you're not looking at environmental toxins, it's like it's like you trying to clean up the water from the leak without treating the leak. So you're just constantly cleaning up the water, being like, okay, the water spill is over. And then the next day you come back and there's more water. The environmental toxins, I truly believe are the main reason as to why we are where we are in terms of our health. And when you see this, you no longer think that your infertility is unexplained. And it's not unexplained because when I look at these symptoms, I know her system is struggling and it's stuck in this fight or flight. And so if she's stuck in fight or flight, my God, like how she, her body is not thinking about reproducing. And she had like her hair falling out and low immune system function. She didn't feel like she had any resiliency in her body. And now pregnancy is the most stressful thing the body will do. Imagine getting pregnant and like when you're already maxed out in your stress and now let's run a marathon. For the body, it's like, I can't, I can't do it. And it's like, it's a protective mechanism because it's not just about getting pregnant. It's you being able to carry that pregnancy to term and then give labor and have breast milk production and not suffer through that postpartum depression. Sometimes I'll have women come to me and like, I'm worried about postpartum depression. It's usually because you already feel depleted. Like I have no problems getting pregnant, but I'm really worried about the next step. It's your internal voice telling you that something is off, right? And for some people, they will they just won't be able to get pregnant because their body's protecting them. Your body is very smart, is what I'm saying. And please, please, please trust it instead of listening to a doctor that knows nothing about you or frankly, sometimes about how the body works because all they do is just push medicine. In summary, high toxic load, parasites, stressing the system out, depleting all her nutrients, causing the nausea, the sluggish liver function, just she was overworked. And then of course, the added stress of her work environment and infertility. First thing is we had to get her out of fight or flight. She got an aura ring right off the bat and she started to see how her sleep was impacted. And so fixing her sleep was really important. And then she actually took a stress leave from her work to focus on herself. And I think, I know that not everybody has that option, but she did because she never took a sick day and she always worked overtime. And so she had like six weeks in the bank to be able to just take off. And so she felt really uneasy about it at first. And then when we started working together, she was like, yeah, I, I really want to do this. And I think it really, really helped her because then it allowed her to focus on cleaning up the environment, clean water, organic food. They got a pure water distiller that I recommend. Got rid of plastic, switched out to non-toxic beauty products. We got them into routines 
And there were some bumps on the road. It wasn't super smooth. I would say within the first three months, white cervical fluid production doubled. So she had nothing. And then it went to like two or three days. She, her digestion improved almost instantly. She still had some nausea, but she didn't have these like frequent loose stools. And she just started to feel a little bit more confident. And then at the six month mark, they went to like a wedding, caught a bug, and it really threw her in for a loop because her HRV, like we started to see improvements in the HRV. And then all of a sudden heart rate elevated again, HRV tanked, and it took her a while to recover. I, I'm not sure what they caught. Like we worked with the immune system and we did stuff, but it took a while for her to shake it off. And how like COVID can cause some menstrual irregularities. That's kind of what happened here. And it wasn't COVID as far as we know, but something that she caught actually caused some irregularities in her cycle, like white cervical fluid production went down. We did some like parasite cleansing. We did liver boosts. We did a lot of stuff. Like there was a general cleanup and then we did some more targeted specific things. She loved walking around and she was doing, but she didn't want to lift weights. Now she was a really petite woman and then she has really tight hips and it took her a while to get into that. How important is exercise for fertility? I would say extremely important, especially if you have any tightness in the hips. Like I can't tell you how many of my patients, I ask them to send me a video of their squat and they can't do a proper squat because their hips are too tight or they're too weak and they have to fall over. If you're a petite person, you have to gain anywhere between 30 to 35 pounds. That's a lot on your skeleton. And so if you already feel weak and frail, you're going to have a lot of pain and a lot of trouble. So she finally started to do some movement, but it was hard for her to get going. And then mentally and emotionally, she like the overthinking, we, we worked with some counseling. And here's the thing, you never know what's enough. What I know is there's always something that you could be doing to improve your health and to heal because healing, there's no destination to your healing journey. And so to me, my job when my couples work with me through my program is to identify the constraint. What's the next step you need to take in order to get you closer to your goals? And I don't know if you need to take three steps or 10 steps or 20 steps, but I know that there's always something that you could be doing. And so what was preventing her getting pregnant at the six month mark was different than when we first started working. Right now, her digestion wasn't bothering her. Her hormones were good. But now she had this kind of mental and emotional block. And now we had to get deeper into movement and building up her mitochondria and building confidence and building a strong skeleton. And so it was one of those, my friend got pregnant without even trying. And it's like, I get it. And it's frustrating. And that will bring up a lot of emotion for you. But we just have to zone in and focus on what is important for us. It doesn't matter what's going on for everybody else because you're just not living everybody else's life. And so if I can get you to just focus on yourself, then it doesn't really matter what's going on around you because it's not about what's going on around you and it's not about anybody else. Um, the thing that we actually noticed on the blood work is her DHEA dropped. And so we actually ended up supporting her DHEA just to get things moving a little bit quicker. But the only thing like at six month mark, all her symptoms were gone, except she had that hair loss that was still sticking around. And the big shift is for her was taking the time off work. It was also finally expressing some difficult emotions. She was very good at just like working through stuff and not letting it get to her. And she actually just needed to, like she needed to let it get to her and actually have the emotional outburst and to feel sad and feel frustrated and let it go through her instead of carrying it, carrying that heaviness. And it's funny because we like had an appointment and I remember she cried a lot and she had some of the best sleep that night. Like her heart rate dropped, her HRV. And I was like, do you see the connection? Like you're carrying all this stress and if you release it, it will actually feel better. And so but releasing your emotions is a practice that you have to learn how to do all the time. It's not something like, oh, I'll do it just this one time and it's done. It's like, no, we always feel emotions. We all, like they're always around us. We just get better. That's what emotional resiliency is, is you get better at dealing with difficult emotions. And those are the emotions that make us tougher. She started lifting weights when she actually noticed like her friends, her family was like, you're changing you're different. Her voice changed, her posture changed. She used to have this kind of almost like whispering low and then she would talk and like there was no stuttering or second guessing. Like she would just talk. Uh, she had some speeches she had to do at a wedding or something like that. And everyone was like, who is this person? And one of the things I'll say to my patients when I'm onboarding them is like, listen, the people that are sitting in front of me today are not the same people that are going to get pregnant. 
right? You're going to go through evolutions and you're going to go through personal growth. Your body, body is going to change mentally and emotionally and spiritually. You're going to grow. So it's really, really big, you guys, to see like when friends and family start to notice it, you're moving in the right direction. We did some parasite cleansing. We did some liver boosting. And really, we watched the data. We watched your HRV. We kept doing testing because we wanted to make sure we were moving in the right direction. And so this is when we retested right before uh, that three month mark before she got pregnant, her ferritin and her iron levels were really good. Her B12 was up, vitamin D was good, and all her immune autoimmune markers were great. Her cholesterol, like you see, that she had a lot of oxidative damage, stress, and all of that was gone. Her lipids, like her HDL, was in such good range now. Blood sugar was very well regulated. Liver enzymes, like just you could really, when I look at this blood work, I remember because they were trying we're like okay when is it happening everybody wants to know when is it happening and like i don't know but when i look at this blood work i'm like we're close this is close because it's good like there is thyroid is good blood sugar is good right everything and so the only thing that came up was that this dhea was on the low side and like look at this prolactin level right 67 47 like non-existent so the stress of infertility was still there but her prolactin was now down because the stress of parasite cleansing was gone. We got the environmental toxins out of her environment, but also out of her body, right? Like she has been on Cellcore. They're the leaders in detoxification and immune support. They were on some heavy duty stuff for over a year. So it took us 13, about 13 months to get pregnant from the time that we got the lab work and started working to a successful pregnancy, if you will. And it was the first one of, uh, of course, we were cautiously optimistic when it happens, but in cases like unexplained infertility, when you first get pregnant, like it's a huge win that you're even getting pregnant. And then when she did get pregnant, all of her stuff came up. They just kind of test platelet counts, but HCG was super high. And this is her B12. They, uh, they tested it again. That was high. Her urine analysis was great. This is the HCG, like 24 hours or 48 hours. It wasn't 72 hours. So it did almost double, but look at this progesterone. It's like, that is so good to see when I see these numbers and I see how high the HCG, it's like, this is good. This is a, the body's definitely doing what it's supposed to be doing. So it was a really big, obviously a, a, a very exciting. And like I said, at the beginning, like pregnancy after infertility, it's really hard. It's still hard. It's not like the trauma of infertility goes away. The moment you're pregnant, you start to question everything. And she was already an overthinker. And so even though she was super ecstatic, they were both, she was so anxious, overthinking every symptom, hyper cautious. Oh, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do anything to cause the miscarriage. Right. So a lot of counseling around that we've already done the work. We have to trust the process leaning into her body, letting go and not like protecting herself and living in a bubble, just really giving herself some space to feel all the emotions. She's at about 15 weeks now, and it's just going to be a big journey for her. I draw this out for my patients all the time that it's not just about your like Fertility is just the beginning of your journey. And then there's pregnancy and then there's postpartum. And so if you make your fertility about your healing journey, then pregnancy can be a very empowering process instead of a traumatic one. And of course, she's still feeling anxiety and overwhelm because we're dealing with infertility is like one of the worst things that a couple can go through. And there's very legitimately PTSD that happens after fertility and this lack of trust in your body and something's going to go wrong or things are going to be taken away from me. So learning really how to manage that to help her go through this process, empowering, and then making this about generational health. Like I cannot lead, wait to meet their baby. I think their baby is just going to be the cutest, healthiest little thing they've ever could have imagined. And they worked so hard for it. So I'm really excited. This couple could have stopped at six month mark because, oh, something happened. I'm still not pregnant or, and we really just continue to lean on the data and the labs and what the body was telling us. And we really just continue to lean on the labs and the data and what the body was telling us, what symptoms were left over. And I call it kind of like distraction. I know, like I said, everyone who comes to see me, they want to achieve a healthy pregnancy, 
but sometimes you don't know how far, like what has to be lined up in order for the body to get pregnant. I always draw, so like if healthy pregnancy is at the top of the mountain, think about it like taking the SATs, the final exam. If you take the exam over and over again and you're failing it, it doesn't mean that like you shouldn't just keep taking the exam. You would go to the professor and you would say, hey, which section of the exam am I failing and by how much? Pregnancy is the same thing, right? We have to have good thyroid function, good gut function, good blood sugar regulation, good immune system function. And so like, there's literally, and obviously like your hormones, and I have literally a list of all the things that need to be working well in order to increase the probability of you conceiving naturally. Because if we look at it as a lens of fertility is a reflection of our health and pregnancy is a natural process, if you look at it as that filter then you're not looking for solution of, well, I'm broken, so I must need medication. You might not feel your best. This patient felt broken all the time. Like she felt like she was just driving a different car than everybody else. And that's not the case. When you look at the environmental toxic load, and we never retested it because for some of my patients, it's a cost thing. For some, it's like, hey, we're still seeing improvements. And I don't, like sometimes I'll retest it a year later. Some people will wanna see the progress and that's totally fine. There's no right or wrong, but she was so overloaded with toxins that were endocrine disruptors and were bogging down her liver. If we remove that, all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, my body does respond the same way that everybody else's does. It was just overloaded. So it's what I want you guys to get inspired by is like, don't give up, make your fertility, your healing journey. Right. These guys, like they went all in on themselves. And when they saw the lab work, it was just like, we have to do this. We just have to do this for ourselves. And they really, even though that end goal was a healthy pregnancy, they really did just focus on their health and what they needed to do to optimize their environment. And both of their healths, like the way that they are now versus a year ago, it's like it's night and day. They can't even compare it. What I also say is like, stay open to the process and allow it for it to change you. When I draw the staircase for my patients, like I said, what prevents you from getting pregnant here should be very different what's here. And so if you're working with somebody and you feel like you're standing still, it's because you're working on this and you need this. I see this all the time. People are like, I'm taking CoQ10, I'm taking an acetocysteine, I'm taking a good fish oil. Great. Those things are all about optimizing. Why do you have CoQ10 that's low? Why are you taking fish oil? Oh, because I heard it was good. I'm like, sure, it's good, but that's not a treatment protocol. That's you just investigating, like going to the store and saying, I heard this was good and I'm just going to try it out and see if it works. So trial and error is a very normal way to kind of play around and see and figure out what's working, but it's not... it. it it's going to take time. Like if you don't worry about time and you're just trying and seeing what happens, that's different versus like, no, I've been struggling with infertility. I want to be pregnant. I want a protocol. You can't just go to the store and pick up a few things because you saw it. an influencer who's struggling with infertility is taking those things. And by the way, if an influencer is taking those things who's struggling with infertility and they're sharing their journey and they're still not getting pregnant, why are we taking it? It's not working for them. Why would it work for you, <laughs> right? I think that's like a ridiculous thing anyway. So it's just really figuring out what it is that you need to do. The process will change you and you do need to be changing. If you're working on your health, aka your fertility, something needs to be improving every month. And for these guys, it was, whether it's with their skin, their digestion, their sleep, their mental and emotional state, their energy, like their aura ring data, their lab work obviously spoke for it as well. Like when we saw that lab work, it's like, this is good lab work. Like this is really good. And she felt good. So the last thing is really that the process doesn't stop once you are pregnant. And this is what I'm passionate about. I know I advertise a lot into my maximized fertility program, but I actually support my patients through pregnancy and postpartum. And I wish that I knew this information with my firstborn. Like I had none of this support and I didn't realize how little support we get. And I really wish I knew what I knew today to help support couples in this really big journey 
journey, not just because you're struggling with infertility, but like becoming a parent and learning how to be healthy and pass on that generational health. I think it's a huge responsibility and it makes sense to give yourself time to prepare and to really build yourself up and to fix your stuff. So then your body can carry through and do this incredible a beautiful thing that it is designed to do. It's just probably a little bit sick and tired and that's why it can do it right now. All right, you guys, I hope you found this case study helpful. If you have any questions, please post them below. If you're interested in applying for my Maximize Your Fertility program, hit the application sign and let's see if I'm the right person to help. But my goal with sharing these case studies is to really give you some hope that there are answers out there. You don't have to aimlessly try things and hope that one of these things is going to stick. There's data, there's tools, there's practitioners that are actually going to help you figure that out and walk you through the process. Is it going to be difficult? Absolutely. Are you going to have to change your diet and lifestyle and do things that are uncomfortable? Absolutely. Is it worth it? 100%. But thanks again for logging in and being here and I'll see you next time.